Welcome back to this show we call the Horse Racing Show. Simple enough because we bring on experts like uh, Matt Bernier from the Daily Racing Forum to make life simple for us and tell us about horse racing and who you should look at, especially with that big race that happens to be coming up the first Saturday in May in Louisville, Kentucky. And Matt joins us now from New England, where it is a little cooler than it is here in Kentucky, where we're doing the show. And Matt, my friend, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me, Kenny. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's always fun. You're one of my favorite people, and I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to you right now. I've said it a number of times. You're one of the nicest people in the entire industry, so it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, you know what? I'm touched. The people behind the scenes here, our producers, oh, they're crying. They're looking. <laughs> they're not buying any of it, but thank you. Uh, you know I, what? I, it, I mean it. I, I, you know what? And I feel the same about you, and I mean that because you should have fun in this sport. And, and that's one thing after years and years of covering it that I keep telling people, you know, there's moments to be serious, but by and large, it should be like going to, and I know you know this place well, Fenway Park. It should be something like a great experience where you just enjoy it and you're happy to be there and uh, not feel like uh, I'm at a cathedral. And sometimes, and yeah, you know. That's just it. You know, you have so many of those times where so many people, and, and I understand, like you say, there are times for serious moments, times to take things, you know, a little bit more more to heart, but at the same time, on the flip side, you know, you kind of look at it and you go, you go through all these different places, you go to all these different events and, and you got, you got to have fun with it. If you're not having fun with it, what's the point? Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and one of the fun things every year is the Kentucky Derby when people say who's going to win. And I'll bet they've been asking you who's going to win since that uh, first pool came out when that leaderboard came out in uh, March or in uh, January, which by the way, Matt, we were talking about it earlier in the show. Uh, there's there's like four or five horses in the top 21 that are still around from the initial pool that are not the pool but the initial leaderboard that came out that's how much horse racing can change in a three-month span it's uh, you know it's the texas techs of the world that's getting in that you wouldn't expect you know like the you know by my standards and horses like that and uh, uh, i think that that's probably one of the things that makes it fun for a handicapper at least Oh, certainly. And, and on the flip side, it certainly makes it fun, but you do, like you say, you have people asking you from some, some early, early months in this entire thing, well, who's going to win? And you can throw out a name in January that, as you may mention, they can either pop up out of nowhere or they can be long gone, totally off the trail entirely. So, you know, you can have a little bit of egg on your face if you give out a name that might not end up living up to expectations. But um, it is what makes this stretch, this three-year-old stretch, I think so much different than the lead up to the Breeders' Cup in November. The Breeders' Cup, we know these horses. They're already established. We know what their strengths, their weaknesses are. With these three-year-olds, I mean, you know, they're on a week-to-week, day-to-day kind of basis where they can go from one race to the next, look brilliant one time, and the next time out, you throw out a complete clunker, and you're sitting there going, what what happened between then and now? So I think that's what that, – that added wrinkle to the three-year-olds. It just makes it that much more difficult, but at the same time, that much more fun to handicap. Do you look at a specific thing when you're looking at, and, and I know there's obviously, you know, first time around two turns, some things like that. Is there kind of a formula that you have, unless you've you got it in a book that you want to sell and you don't have to tell us anything, but uh, <laughs> do you have a formula out there that you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this three-year-old. I'm not, in, I'm not, you know, liking him a whole lot, but I'll keep an eye on him because he did something like this in a race. Yeah, so especially early on with the two-year-olds and turning three-year-olds, when they do stretch out to two turns for the first time, I always – you know, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword where you see a horse finish really well going a shorter distance. Well, that doesn't always mean that it's going to translate out to two turns and going longer distances. But one thing that I'm always very, very anxious to see with those kind of early types is how they gallop out. And I know many people don't believe in it. and Many people do believe it. I'm part of that camp that does believe that, you know, if they continue on through the wire and around the far turn, around the first turn, excuse me, and they, they really feel like it looks like they're they're wanting to go, that the engine's just getting cooking. That's kind of something for me that would suggest, okay, that maybe, you know what, in more time, with more distance, with more seasoning, maybe two turns is going to be within their scope. I think another thing that's, you know, it, it seems like it's an obvious thing, but the trainer goes a long way, in my opinion. And certain trainers, if they haven't been there on a stage like this, and it's not meant to be a knock against anyone, but if it's your first time going through – you know, I mean, look, even last year with, with someone as, as brilliant as Aiden O'Brien, this, yes. that was their first run through. And he said, we weren't prepared. It was just a totally different ball game. Whereas you have Barnes like Bob Baffert and Todd Pletcher that this is sure they're still excited and it's new and it's unique with these new horses each time. But they've been there. They've done that. They know how to get a horse ready to go for that. 
Um, so I think you do always want to be a little bit cognizant of that sort of thing as well. People ask me, they said, is this going to be a handicapping show when we first started doing this? I said, no, there's good handicapping shows already in existence, like uh, Matt Bernier's show on uh, DRF TV, and I mean that. And so I said, you know, what we'll do is have handicappers on, but I'd like to find out a little bit about the personalities. And uh, I know with Matt, uh, a big score in a national handicapping tournament, uh, work with the DRF, uh, people are tuning in to get your picks on everything. How did, how did young Matt get into horse racing? I tell you what, it was, uh, and I, it, when I tell people, they still don't really believe me, but I had, I had no real exposure, no real interest in horse racing all the way up until probably, probably right around 20, 21. And I went home from my school one night. I went to school, uh, one town away from where my parents live. Uh, so I went back there cause I wanted to have good food as opposed to the dining hall food. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I turned on TVG and, you know, working for the forum, you know, there's always the politics and whatnot that go into it. But I, I, I will always say I turned on TVG because it was on part of our sports package. I thought it was intriguing enough watching the horses run around and I didn't know how the odds were set. Did a little bit of homework. One thing led to another. I, I was introduced to tournaments, uh, won the first tournament I played in, qualified for that contest out in Las Vegas, the National Horse Players Championship. Um, I was the youngest one there at the time. That spun into a reality TV show. The producers called me from Los Angeles and said, you know, we we're doing this thing. We'd like you to come along. I thought it was a joke at first. I was half expecting to get to the airport in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, back when I was living out in the western part of the state, saying that, you know, there, there is no ticket here for you. This is all <laughs> fake. This is all nonsense. They pulled the wool over your eyes. Uh, but it all worked out, and uh, it, it kicked off with Ben uh, it's been a pretty a pretty crazy past five to six years. I'll be coming up on five years of the racing form here in about a month. So uh, it, it feels like it doesn't feel like it's been five years, uh, but it, it's been it's been a great a great ride. And, and however things play out for the future, um, you know, it, it, anything can happen at any time. Everybody's aware of that. But uh, if nothing else happened from here on out, I, I would look back and say this has been a hell of a ride. Oh, it's been amazing and, and well-deserved, by the way. Uh, not just uh, you as a person, but uh, your talent as well for picking horses. Was this something that was almost like, was it a math thing for you that got you into it, that made it click so much? Because I know a lot of guys that studied for years, and you know, if they could just get to one minor tournament, they're happy. And they're pretty good handicappers. You know, you could go out and spend a day with them at, at uh, Churchill Downs in the middle of the summer, for example, uh, and, you know, they'll win a few races. But uh, there's there's still got to be something about the math or something that made you so good so early to go into major tournaments and beat seasoned veterans out there, I think. It, or was it just you're just that good? No, no I'm never <laughs> going to say that. You know that. I know. I've said it for you. I do think it's one of those things for me. I've always related to people that uh, I grew up playing baseball. I love baseball. It's one of my, one of my, you know, passions. And it, funny enough that we're talking, it's the home opener for the Red Sox today. You know, I, I loved baseball since I was very, very young and I grew up collecting baseball cards. And it's one of those things when, when people open up the daily racing form or they open up whatever past performances they're using, um, if they've never been exposed to them before, it can be very intimidating. You have no idea what you're looking at. Right. And for me, it felt very similar to the back of a baseball card with all the st statistics just laid out for you. And once you understood what each what each item meant, it was really not nearly as difficult or as daunting as maybe it looked at face value. So I do think, it, it, sure, it's not apples to apples, but I think there was at least a little bit of a you know, it wasn't so intimidating. It didn't seem so overwhelming to me when I first started looking at it. Um, and, and I do think there's a, a little bit of the element of, you know, the, I mean, the gambling piece, obviously it's, it's right. a major part of the game, but the, the idea of looking for value, you know, picking a winner is all well and good, but you know, there are certain instances that it, it helps you a little bit more picking a winner than others do. And sometimes, you know what, I'm going to be fine taking a horse that I think should be four to one that's going off at seven or eight to one. And if they win, great. I think I made the right play. And if they lose, I still think I made the right play. I think that whole sort of game theory and odds and numbers and percentages, I've always been attracted to that sort of stuff too. So I think that helped make it an easier kind of transition and learning curve. I bet people ask you, you met my cousin, Johnny, right? Lives in Oklahoma city. we met at Kingland. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. You know, he's, he, uh, is a pretty good handicapper. I'm trying to get him in some tournaments because I think he is really good. What advice do you give those uh, novice handicappers or those guys that's tried it a couple of times and, uh, 
you know, sometimes maybe they're a little intimidated. Sometimes they're not. Johnny's not. I know that. He'll just dive right in. But uh, is, is there advice going into a tournament uh, for the first time or second time? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's so many people, particularly new folks, that get involved and they're so afraid of being embarrassed. We're going out there and if, you know what, if you don't, if you don't connect on anything, if you end up going zeroed out for the entire day or the entire two days, how, whatever kind of format it is. Um, I remember early on when we were taping the reality show, and I joke about it. I say I kind of got a college education from all of the other folks that were there on the show. I learned a little bit from each of them. Um, it, you know, One of the first things that they instilled in me, particularly Michael Baychok, who won the NHC a few years back, he, he's based down in Louisiana. He said, if you didn't People that go for zero, that end up zeroing out, they had as good a chance, if not better, to win than the folks that end up mid-pack for the most part. Because if you go broke, you at least were going for the win. You weren't just trying to slide through and just, you know, there's no real moral victories in, in, in a contest. It's a situation where you either win or you lose. Um, and I understand there are different prizes and things like that. But the idea of out of 100 people, if you finished 40th, mm -hmm. did you ever really have a chance to win? Right. And I think that's the sort of thing where, you know, if you go out there and you end up going broke, if you're playing live money and cash, or even if you don't, if you have a day where you just don't pick any winners, but you were taking shots on 10, 12 to one chances, you know what? Don't, don't feel bad. Cause it, it happens to everyone. I played in a contest this past weekend uh, at Mohegan sun, one of the casinos in Connecticut. I drove down with my best friend and I, you know, what? I had an opinion in uh, the uh, race down at Keeneland, the Commonwealth. I liked uncontested. He was just, kind of slow getting into stride and at that point he was buying the eight ball and i zeroed out but i had my opinion i took my chance if he had run well and won i would have been in good shape he didn't you know what it is what it is we 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 turn the page and there's going to be another contest another opportunity down the road so just don't don't let yourself get down if you have a little bit of a dry spell or you end up zeroing out sometimes you got to go richard dreyfus and let it ride 100%. 100%. The world's greatest movie of horse, horse racing. We've talked about that several times. That's It's it's fun. I, I love that movie. And there's nobody that's ever played in a tournament that doesn't love that movie, is there? No, no. I mean, because I think it is, when, you know, at, at its core, it kind of feels like that's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. You are just, you're going for it. And sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not. And, you know, you can only hope that over time, when you do finally connect one because it's it is one of those things if you have any kind of proficiency there's going to be a day that you get lucky the stars are going to line up it's going to happen uh you just hope that when that happens it it makes up for all the losses and then some and i think that's kind of uh, another analogy going back to just playing the horses in general you hope that your wins they're not going to happen nearly as often as your losses are we all lose technically percentage-wise more than we win but you hope that the earnings and the revenue that you get back from the wins make up for all those losses have you had a chance to really break this derby field down just yet? And uh, maybe Roadster jumped in. Well, there's Baffert again. He looks like he's got three. Maybe if Improbable blows him away this weekend in Arkansas, I don't know. Maybe he jumps up as a favorite. Uh, I don't know right now. Who do, you, who do you like as far as two or three horses that at least you keep looking at uh, leading up to the derby, Matt? Well, you brought up Roadster. I thought that was a pretty impressive effort there at Santa Anita last weekend. Just the fact that on the, going into the far turn looked like he was actually losing ground. And then and then he just sort of jumped back into it when Smith wheeled him out into the clear. I think you have to look at him as a legitimate player. Uh, both of the efforts, assuming improbable, does get into the field uh, just based on the talent that he's shown. Game winner, don't ever, don't ever question a champion. Right. And it's not like he's run poorly in either of his three-year-old starts thus far. He just got beat by a couple of good horses. Um, outside of that, I have to be honest. I mean, this has been a little bit of a topsy turvy three year old group so far where they've it's taken a little while. At least we got a little bit of formfulness this past weekend. Tacitus, I have to start looking at him and saying, you know what? The pedigree is there. The connections are there. And I like that he's a little bit battle hardened. He had some things not go his way early on there in the wood mm -hmm. where they were all playing pinball bumper cars off yeah. of one another. And, and he was still able to overcome all that. Um, one other horse that I've always been concerned about distance wise. And he ran this past weekend down at Keeneland in the bluegrass. I really was taken by the effort from win, 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 because yeah. on the far turn, you know, if he had not gotten stopped the way that he did, maybe he doesn't defeat Vacoma, but it's a heck of a lot closer than three lengths or three and a half lengths. And the way that he finished, you know, all along, I thought maybe he was going to be a one turn kind of seven eights closing sprinter. I, I, you know, I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong. I, I think there's a chance that this horse actually is going to continue to improve 
with additional ground, he got his final eighth of a mile, just over 12 seconds, about 12 and two. And, and just, if you want to try to project forward, you got to deal with an extra eighth of a mile for the Derby. Yeah. I'm looking for anyone that can get sub 26 seconds for that final quarter. I think win, 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 maybe now he's going to be a little bit under the radar, but I, I, I'm growing increasingly intrigued by him. And now the most important question, Red Sox rest of the season. I mean, it can't be any worse than it started. They're three, they're three and eight going into the it's, home it's, opener. It's like they didn't know the gate opened. It's like the right. gate didn't open for them. You know, the frustrating thing, too, is you hear Alex Cora, the manager, and you, it, it's almost like they just they think that they're the Patriots and they can just build in, you know, a slow start. And, oh, it's fine. You know, there's a long way to go. Well, everyone on Sports Talk Radio up here is bringing it up, and I think it is as straightforward as this. You know, the first 11 count the same as the last 11 do. Yeah. Or the middle 11 in August, any time throughout. So, I mean, a three and eight stretch is not good at any point in the year. So hopefully the starting pitching turns it around. I still think they're a good team. I still think they'll win, you know, right around 90, low 90 kind of as far as the total wins are concerned. I don't know if that's enough to run with the Yankees for the division, but um, it's still a, it's still a talented team. They just need to, they got to shake the cobwebs out and get ready to go here. Matt, it's great to catch up with you. I look forward to seeing you in person. And uh, thanks again for taking time to be on our show. Kenny, always a pleasure. Whenever you want, give me a call. All right. Matt Bernier from the Daily Racing Forum. You can watch him on DRF TV. Keep up with him as one of the top handicappers out there. You want to know what's going on? Pay attention to him each week. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with more right now in a minute on the Horse Racing Show.